So it's now uh, ooh, about just gone uh, two o'clock, so we should kick off. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Society for Popular Astronomy. Uh, we've got a, a, a couple of little announcements before we kick off. Um, one is that this is, uh, uh, it's bizarre, this is WizPass. It's, it's now my uh, last session as president of SPA. And it's been, a, it's been fabulous, actually. And, and wow, the last two years have just whizzed by. Um, and my goodness, a lot has happened. Um, but it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Andrew Coates, who will be the incoming president. Uh, so we will swap roles. So I'll, I'll transfer from being president to vice president and, and Andrew will uh, transfer to, from vice president to president. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so just uh, introduce myself a little bit. So I'm Andrew Coates from UCL's Mullard Space Science Laboratory, and um, I'm a planetary scientist. I've been lucky enough to be involved in many space missions, including all the way back to Giotto, but Cassini, and currently I'm principal investigator for the PANCAM instrument on the ExoMars on, on the ExoMars 2022 rover going to Mars. So exciting times ahead, and uh, and also exciting times ahead for the SPA. And um, and just to thank Stephen very much for the for the last couple of years um, uh, presidency, uh, which has gone very well. Um, I've been vice president for the last year. It's been great to work with you. So uh, all the best with the future. And we've got another year together anyway. Um, but uh, but yeah, so looking forward to this um, uh, to this next couple of years. Thanks. Marvelous. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and it's also my pleasure to introduce Stephen Feeney, who is our uh, our first speaker today. So Stephen Feeney is a cosmologist at University College London and a Royal Society University Research Fellow there. And uh, he's going to talk to us about, well, what I think is probably the most interesting thing going on in cosmology at the moment, which is this uh, crisis in the, the Hubble constant, the tension, people call it, in the, in, in the Hubble constant. Uh, so, Stephen, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me just figure out how to do this because I've killed off my presentation. Nope. There we go. Hang on. My Zoom gone. There we go. So that one. And... Right, can you see my slides okay? Yes, that's good. Yes. And yeah. can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, okay, brilliant, fantastic. Okay, yes, well, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for, for asking me to speak and thank you for spending such a beautiful sunny Saturday with me today. Um, so yeah, my name is Stephen Feeney. I'm a, a lecturer in a, a Royal Society URF at, uh, at UCL. And uh, yeah, today I was going to talk to you about um, the, the Hubble constant, so the expansion rate of the universe. So to give a, a very brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about, um, uh, so I'm going to give quite a broad talk, I guess, about uh, the expansion rate and uh, how we have, uh, how we discovered it, how we've tried to measure it now for about a century or so. Um, and how the fact that it, it's always been a, a source of controversy in, in, in cosmology, in astrophysics, um, and that that is uh, no different today, that, that, that currently, arguably, the biggest disagreement in cosmology is over the, 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 the speed at which the universe is expanding. Um, and so I'll give a bit of history of that. I'll talk about the current crisis and, and what might cause it. Um, and how we hope to resolve this crisis, um, in particular using uh, observations of gravitational waves. Um, and yeah, please, uh, I don't know about exact format, but please, if, if, if you have any questions, please do feel free to ask them and I'll try and answer them um, as and when. So, okay, hopefully you can all see this, uh, this animation. Um, so, yeah, hopefully everyone on this call is aware that we live in an expanding universe. Um, if not, then then you do know now. Um, so we've known this now for around 90 years, I guess. Um, and ever since we discovered the fact that we live in an expanding universe, we've, we've wanted to know how fast that universe is expanding. You know, obviously, it's the first question that you ask, but it, but it has consequences beyond, you know, just a, a, a trivial piece of information, because if we know how quickly the, the universe is expanding, we can estimate the age of the universe, 
And with larger physical theories, we can start to also learn about, you know, what the universe is made of, whether or not it's, uh, it's uh, just got, you know, normal matter in, whether it's got dark matter, dark energy, things like that. And the, the, the cool thing about um, these measurements of, of, the, of the universe's expansion speed um, is, you know, these are fundamentally measurements of like the large scale universe, you know, they, they truly are cosmological measurements. They tell us something about, you know, the entire age of the universe, but the measurements that we can actually make, you know, in our own backyard, astrophysically speaking, you know, by looking at uh, stars and galaxies in and near the Milky Way. But the problem is that it's, that it's hard, okay? We've spent essentially 90 years now trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, and, and, and we've spent a lot of that time arguing over the results. So um, we should start at the beginning, right? Uh, we should try and figure out um, how we know that the universe is expanding. Um, and we can do that, you know, right here on this call um, by thinking of the universe as a, as a, um, as a line, right? Okay, on, on, a, uh, on an elastic band, and then we can stretch that elastic band to, to simulate the universe expanding. So that's what's happening in this little video. So what we've done here is taken a, uh, the universe as an elastic band and drawn some little black dots, which are galaxies, okay? The dot on the left is, um, is supposed to be us, for example. The other two dots we can just think of as other galaxies in the universe. They start off uh, uh, being equally spaced, right? So one is an inch away, one's two inches away. But as the universe expands, you can see that the nearby galaxy moves to two inches away and the, the more distant galaxy moves to four inches away. And so what we immediately see there is that the more distant galaxy has moved further in the same amount of time. And so the speed at which that galaxy moves away from us is, is proportional to its distance, right? So the thing that is two times further away moves two times faster. And this was figured out in the, in the late 1920s by uh, relativists like Friedman and Lemaitre, who basically said, you know, the, the speed galaxies move away is proportional to their distance. Because the other really interesting consequence is the fact that if you switch around and say that we are this, this galaxy here that starts off two, two inches uh, away, then you can see that the same is true for that galaxy too, that the, the middle galaxy, which is nearest to it, tends to move away more slowly than this galaxy, which is furthest away. So all galaxies would appear to be moving away from all other galaxies um, uh, with this speed that's proportional to distance. And so that's what the theorists predicted. Um, and uh, lo and behold, that was discovered um, by Edwin Hubble in 1929, except for the fact that, that Lemaitre actually discovered it two years earlier, but he doesn't get credit for it because he published in the wrong journals. Um, but so Edwin Hubble, here um, is seen at the Mount Wilson Observatory, pointing a gigantic telescope at the sky, which is you know, what all astrophysicists should really do. But unfortunately, we don't sit in front of computers. Um, but there he is taking pictures of, uh, of the universe um, and, and in particular taking pictures of other galaxies. And what he did was that he figured out, so this is his discovery plot here, that if you plot the distances of galaxies, so each one of these little dots is a, is a galaxy, you see that the things that are furthest away are actually moving more quickly than the ones nearby and that you get this linear relation, right? It's just a, there's just a straight line that you can draw through them. And so that's proving this fact that we live in, a, in an expanding universe. Um, the great thing there is that you can figure out the expansion speed, so the, the rate at which the universe is expanding just by finding the slope of that line. So dividing the galaxy speeds by their distances and so what he thought was that the expansion rate of the galaxy is, is between 450 and 570 kilometers per second per megaparsec, where, you know, kilometers per second per megaparsec, that's the unit of the measurement, which is fulfilling this requirement that all astrophysical measurements have to have crazy units. From here on in, you can just think of it, just drop the units, doesn't really matter. The, uh, what Hubble thought was that the, the universe was expanding at a rate of around 500, okay? So how did he do that? So in order to make that measurement, he needed to figure out galaxy speeds and he needed to figure out their distances. So let's consider both of those in turn. How did he figure out the speeds? Well, he, he, he figured out the speeds of galaxies using something called redshift, right? So this is a concept that's just exactly analogous to um, Doppler shifting, right? Where you have a, an ambulance with its siren on coming towards you in the street. And as it approaches, uh, the pitch of the siren gets higher and higher and higher uh, because the uh, the sound waves are being emitted slightly closer to you every time. So their wavelength gets squished. So the pitch goes up um, and as it passes you, uh, 
um, the pitch drops lower and lower and lower because of the opposite effect that basically the sound waves are getting stretched. And so the same thing happens for light with galaxies. So if you have a galaxy in, at this point it's moving uh, away from us, then the colors of light that are being emitted by that galaxy, they get stretched, so they become more red. If you have a galaxy now that's moving towards us, um, the light gets compressed, gets squeezed, so the wavelengths shrink, so the, the colors of the galaxy become more blue. And the great thing there is that this shift in color uh, is, is proportional to the, uh, to, the, to, the star, uh, to the galaxy's speed, right? So if you can figure out how much the, the colors have been shifted, you can figure out how fast the galaxy is moving. So how do we do that? Well, uh, so we know that certain elements, certain um, molecules in the lab uh, emit or absorb light at certain, uh, of certain colors, of certain wavelengths, right? And we know what galaxies are roughly made of. And so we can look at the spectra of galaxies so we can figure out all of the light that they, they produce. And we can find places where there are gaps, right? Dark bits here where there's lots of absorption or maybe there are peaks where they emit lots and lots of light. We can figure out what elements those correspond to. We can observe where those gaps appear to be in the galaxy spectrum. We can compare them to our reference points in the lab and we can figure out the kind of shift that's been applied and so figure out how quickly the galaxies are moving. And so that's what Hubble did. The important thing to, to realize here is that galaxies don't just you know, sit still on this rubber band that we were stretching. They also move towards each other. So if a galaxy is sitting next to a, a big hef, heavy galaxy uh, or a cluster of galaxies, you know, it has its own kind of local peculiar motions. Um, and so what that means is because um, the, the speed of the universe's expansion goes up with distance, uh, it means that this, this shifting uh, becomes, you know, dominated by the universe's expansion at large distances. So if we want to measure the expansion rate of the universe, we need to look at large distances, find distant galaxies and, and figure out their speeds. Anything nearby has these redshifts polluted by, by their kind of local motions. Okay, so that's um, uh, uh, speeds. How did Hubble measure distances? Well, you know, uh, this is hard, right? This has always been hard in, in, in astronomy. Uh, because we can't just stick a ruler out into space and, and, and figure out how far away a star is. You know, the nearest thing that we have to that is, is something called parallax, right? Um, where you basically take a picture of the sky in summer, wait until winter where we're on the other side of the sun, take the same picture of, of the same patch of sky and you'll see anything nearby will appear to move around on the sky compared to a, the more distant sources, right? It's like putting your finger up and opening and closing one eye, your finger appears to move around compared to things that are more distant in the background. So that's a very reliable way of, of getting distances, um, but it only works for things that are very nearby, right? Because we can't move any further away from the sun um, than, than the Earth's orbit. And so what Hubble did and what uh, astrophysics, astrophysicists still use today is, is use things called standard candles, right? So standard candles are uh, basically astronomical objects where we think we know the true brightness. Ideally, you know, it's one population of objects that has exactly the same brightness. Um, but, but, but you can also use, you know, things where, or populations where you know each intrinsic, each individual object's true brightness. That's, that's totally fine, as long as they're well behaved. Um, and then you can use these standard candles to figure out distances, right? Because, you know, imagine that you know exactly how bright this candle is, uh, you can stick the candle down some long, weird corridor with galaxies in it um, and see how bright it appears to be and compare that apparent brightness to the, to the true brightness and figure out the distance to that object, right? It just goes down as one over distance squared. Um, now, the problem here is the fact that you need to know how you know, truly bright your standard candle is. And that means that you have to have one of these standard candles near, near enough to you where you can figure out its actual distance using parallax, okay? And so for a standard candle to be useful, you have to have one, one of those things or, or ideally a number of those things within the Milky Way because that's where we can get parallaxes. The problem then is the fact that, uh, like I said, in order to measure the expansion rate of the universe, you want to be able to measure distances and speeds of galaxies that are very, very far away. That implies that you also need to have standard candles that are extremely bright, 
because you need to be able to find them in these distant galaxies. And, and those two things are just impossible to, to kind of balance against each other. Uh, very bright things are very rare and you don't tend to find them in the Milky Way. And so what Hubble did was he combined two different types of standard candle into something called a distance ladder, right? So you basically find a um, not so bright, but common standard candle. And in, in Hubble's case, this was Cepheid variable stars. And then you, you, you basically bundle them together with much brighter uh, standard candles that you can see further away, but that you can't find in the Milky Way. And what Hubble used uh, was what he thought were the brightest stars in any galaxy, okay? And so this is, this is a little schematic of how his, um, his distance ladder worked, right? So what you do is you find some uh, Cepheids in, um, in the Milky Way, where you can get parallaxes to them, so you can figure out the true brightness of those Cepheids. Then you go along and you find some other galaxy that's, that's nearby, but not super far away, where you can find Cepheids within that galaxy. You can figure out the apparent brightnesses of those Cepheids, um, compare them to the, to the true brightness of the Cepheids, and then figure out a distance to this galaxy. What Hubble did next was then say, okay, so I'm going to say that the brightest star in this galaxy is then, you know, that will have the same brightness as the brightest star in any other galaxy. Okay, so we know the distance to this galaxy, we can figure out the true brightness of that brightest star, and then we can go find some much more distant galaxies where we can't see Cepheids because they're too far away, but we can see the brightest stars, and we can compare the apparent brightness of these stars to what we think their true brightness is to figure out a distance. And then we can take spectra of these galaxies in order to get speed. So we have distances, speeds, and that gives us the expansion rate of the universe. So that's how Hubble did it. Um, the problem with that is the fact that, that some of Hubble's approximation, sorry, assumptions weren't the best, right? Uh, so he made two that were particularly problematic. The first was the fact that um, Cepheids aren't really standard candles. I mean, they're not really standard candles anyway, but that's another story for another time. But there are two types of Cepheids. So, uh, and they have different intrinsic brightnesses. And so that scrambles some of his results. Uh, the biggest problem was the fact that his brightest stars in each galaxy weren't in fact stars at all, but were um, stellar nurseries. So they were, uh, you know, regions of gas with, with baby stars in, very, very bright young stars in. And so they are, not single stars, they're actually much brighter than single stars, and um, they're much more variable, right? Because it, it depends on how many stars are in the nursery as to how bright it is. So they're, not, they're not good standard candles. Um, and so, you know, over the next few decades, people figured these, these problems out, took better data, and brought the, uh, the measurements of the expansion rate down from um, 500 to something closer to around 100. Um, and in fact, uh, there was a long period of time, you know, a couple of decades that people apparently called the Hubble Wars, which seems like a bit of an overreaction, but apparently from some of the correspondence that might be closer to the truth than you think, where the two, you know, great proponents of the time, so Alan Sandage here on the left and Gerard de Bocola, had a factor of two difference between their estimates of what the expansion rate should be. So Sandage thought it was 50, de Bocola thought it was something more like 100. And they could not agree. They could not work this out between themselves and had some pretty spiky uh, exchanges about um, each other's science. And this, this like entrenched view that the, the, the expansion rate was either 50 or 100 really persisted for a long time. Um, and it needed something um, completely new to break the deadlock. And luckily that came along in the, in the 90s in the form of the Hubble Space Telescope. And this, this kind of changed the game in such a way that um, this, this factor of two disagreement just disappeared. Um, so why is the Hubble telescope so great for this? Well, fundamentally because it's above the atmosphere, right? So here it is, a picture of it in low earth orbit, looking totally awesome. Um, what does that allow you to do? Well, it basically allows you to see the full sky, right? Because it's spinning around the earth, you're not tied to one hemisphere like you are on, if you have a ground-based telescope, but you also have incredible resolution, right? So. Here's a little picture of, of, of some random galaxy from the ground using the Subaru telescope, right, which has an eight meter diameter versus the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a 2.4 meter diameter. And you just see all of this incredible detail within this image that you just don't get from the ground. And when you're trying to look for galaxies and you're trying to look for specifically uh, for, for Cepheids, so like individual stars within galaxies that you have to resolve, having this resolution is, is like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of game changing. 
it turns out that compared to the best ground-based telescopes at the time, you could see Cepheid something like 10 times further, or at least 10 times further than, than what um, people like Sandage were using. Um, and so because of the volume effect, right, you have 10 cubed, you basically have a thousand times more data to play with. Um, so it means you can see lots more galaxies with Cepheids, um, but most importantly, it means that you can see galaxies with Cepheids in and a type 1a supernova, right? So what is a type 1a supernova? Well, this is what's being played on this animation right now. Type 1a supernova is that explosion where you basically have, once this loops around again, you have a, a white dwarf, so stellar remnant, right? Something that's shed off all of its, 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 its envelope and it's accreting mass. It's dragging hydrogen off this, this red giant star. And when it does that, it basically gets denser and hotter until the core ignites in a complete runaway fusion reaction and just obliterates the entire star itself. So this is like 1.4 suns worth of stuff exploding um, uh, at once. And it's extremely bright. It can outshine the, the host galaxy. Um, and so you can see these things miles away across the universe. And so you, you would expect uh, miles away, that's a terrible phrase, a long way across the universe. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so they actually, the galaxy is very bright. Um, oh yeah, and because uh, this, this process happens, this explosion happens once uh, a certain critical mass is reached, you might expect that these things therefore produce a similar amount of energy every time, and so they're good standard candles. And there's a lot of complex discussion about how good standard candles these things really are. Um, uh, but they, they basically are for, uh, for, for the purposes of this talk. Um, yeah, and so prior to this point, prior to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we weren't able to uh, find a galaxy that had uh, both Cepheids and a Type 1a supernova in just because we couldn't see far enough. And these things happen once every 100 years per galaxy or something like that. And so with HST, that allowed us to see um, Cepheids and supernova in the same galaxy, which means that we can have these, this, this really great distance ladder. And so we can now start talking about, you know, really modern measurements of the Hubble constant of, the, of this expansion, right? So um, this was one of the key projects of the Hubble Space Telescope and a project led by uh, Wendy Friedman and collaborators. And so what did they do? Well, they used the Hubble Space Telescope to find so you have galaxy, uh, sorry, Cepheids in either the Milky Way or the Large Magellanic Cloud, where we can find parallaxes to them, so we can work out the intrinsic brightness of the of the of the Cepheids. Then we look further out now and find galaxies that have both Cepheids and a Type One A supernova in them. Uh, so that allows us to figure out the intrinsic brightness of the supernova, and then we can look way out into space uh, and find galaxies with. Uh, where we can't see Cepheids because they're too dim, but we can see these type 1a supernovae because they can outshine the entire host galaxy. These things are so far away that, that their motion is completely dominated by the expansion of the universe. And so you can get a very clean measure of that expansion rate by comparing the apparent brightness of the supernova to the true brightness, which we get from these galaxies and working out the, um, the speed of the galaxies uh, from their spectra. And so you have uh, Wendy Friedman coming in here right now and saying, you know, uh, the expansion rate is, is is somewhere between 64 and 80, so something like 75, which lo and behold is halfway between Sandage and Tavokola's number. Um, but this result was so just convincing that it is essentially ended this, this, this factor of two uh, discussion. And so for a moment, all was well with uh, measurements of the expansion rate. And in fact, things just got better. So um, Again, using the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we have people uh, like Adam Reese, right? So Adam Reese put together a, a team called the Shoes Team, um, whose uh, purpose was to uh, uh, basically just refine this measurement even more. And so they got more and more data. They basically found lots more Cepheids. They found lots more galaxies with both Cepheids and supernovae in it, and lots more supernova measurements too tried to measure everything using just one instrument so that you didn't have to care about calibrations of different uh, of, of different instruments and over the course of a decade and i mean they're still going 
Uh, but over the course of this, that the first decade of the of the 21st century, you know, it got down to the point where we can now say that the expansion rate is somewhere between 72 and 75, right? So we've gone from having an uncertainty, well, we've gone from 500 plus or minus kind of 50 to something like 73 plus or minus one and a half, which is an incredible, just an incredible achievement, basically. Um, uh, but then things started unraveling again. Um, and they started unraveling, at least partially because of data from um, this instrument, which is uh, the Planck satellite. <clears throat> and what we're seeing the, the Planck satellite doing here uh, is observing the, the cosmic microwave background, right? So this is the radiation that's left over from uh, the Big Bang in the early universe. So you have the Big Bang, uh, everything is like a super particles, they combine into protons and electrons, uh, and, and radiation, right? And the radiation just bounces off the electrons until the universe cools, cools, cools to the point where um, the, the protons and electrons combine and the light is released. And then we basically see this today as microwave radiation. And what we're showing here is, is Planck's view of the universe. What it sees is the galaxy in front, but you see these little blobs in the background. What it really sees in the background is, is, is well, we, we'll get to that. Basically, for the cosmic microwave background, you see this microwave radiation essentially with the same intensity across the whole sky, apart from these tiny little fluctuations, which are kind of uh, uh, one in 100,000 uh, in terms of intensity. And so if you make a map of the sky, this is what um, the Planck satellite did. So you see these tiny little hot and cold spots in this radiation where these hot and cold spots are the seeds of structure. So each one of these things would grow eventually into you know, galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Um, so Planck satellites saw this, but why is it interesting? Well, fundamentally it's interesting because um, this microwave background, this pattern that you see, it changes, it depends on how fast the universe is expanding, okay? So we have a theory of how the universe began and how it evolves, which is cosmology. Um, and it also tells us what the, the cosmic microwave background should look like um, given some sets of parameters, right? So like if we change the amount of normal matter in the universe and the amount of dark matter or the amount of dark energy, uh, we would see different cosmic microwave backgrounds. We would basically see more or less blobs of a certain size on the sky. And it also depends on, on how quickly the universe is expanding now. So this is what I'm showing here with this really nice tool that you can play around with on the internet. Um, I'm showing what the universe, oh, sorry, what the cosmic microwave background looks like if your expansion rate is 40 or if it's 100. And you can see here that you have much bigger blobs, you have much smaller blobs in the, in the, uh, the case where the expansion rate is larger, or at this completely randomly picked value of 67, where you can see that there's, there's something in between. And so what you can do is you can play around with your theory and you can tweak these parameter values and you can compare that to what the observations look like, which is this top triangle in each one of these plots. And so you can figure out, um, you know, for which amounts of normal matter or dark matter or dark energy, you get blobs that look most like the blobs that you actually see in the Planck observations. And when you do that, you figure out that um, the, the cosmological theories that are best agreeing with the data have expansion rates of around 67 to 68. Um, and this is completely different to what the, the SHOES team finds using the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and you can see how much the, the discrepancy is by looking at this plot here. So apologies for including the graph, but what we can see is right now at around 2020, we have these, uh, so these are the measurements from the uh, the distance ladder formed from the Cepheid and supernova observations. And these are the measurements that we get from the cosmic microwave background down here. And the allowed values are basically these shaded black and blue regions. And you can see that they, there's absolutely no overlapping at all. And that this all appeared in 2013 when the Planck satellite first started uh, with its first release. Prior to that point, the uncertainties were big enough that there was a good overlap and so everything was in agreement. So it's, it's safe to say that this is the this is the biggest um, disagreement that we have in current cosmology, and it looks a lot like a crisis. People talk about a crisis because there's there's such a huge discrepancy here, but actually it's it's super exciting, and 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 it's a real. I think you can think of it as an opportunity instead. Now, why is that true? Um, 
Well, so if you, if you remember how we estimated the, the, the rate of the universe's expansion using the cosmic microwave background, what we did was we took the theory of the universe and we changed its parameters. So we added a bit more dark energy, we added a bit more dark matter, and we figured out which of the, the theoretical backgrounds that that model predicts agrees with the one that we actually see. And so if you think about what, what we're doing um, in that process, what we're doing here, we have like a history of the universe from the Big Bang to when the cosmic microwave background was emitted to the time when the first stars came on and the galaxies appeared to the present day, which we think is around 13.8 billion, 13 billion years later. What we're doing is we're, we're kind of taking a picture of the universe as it looked around 14 billion years ago and we're putting in a full theory of the universe's origin and evolution in order to say what the expansion rate was today, okay? And so um, this depends fundamentally on the entire theory of, of, of the universe that we have. And so if this is wrong or incomplete, then we might come up with an incorrect expansion now compared to the, the CMB that we've put in. And so this is why it's exciting, right? Because this is this Planck expansion rate is fundamentally dependent on the fact that we've got the model of the universe right. Um, and so the immediate question there is, well, maybe we've got this theory wrong. Maybe there's not the right stuff in it, or maybe there's some other, you know, uh, completely funky particle or field um, that we should be including in this theory in order to get this 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 Planck. Uh, prediction for what the expansion rate should be right um, and so that is super exciting because this you know as I said this is the biggest problem in cosmology um, maybe it's shouting at us that you know that, that we have more neutrinos than we think should be uh, in, in physics or maybe there's some weird early form of dark energy that gives the universe an extra extra shove here and makes it expand a little faster than we expect it to to do in our normal model but of course, there's, a, there's another potential explanation, which is, well, maybe we just don't understand our data. Um, you know, these are hard problems, hard analysis problems, and maybe we're just missing something. Um, we're not quite modeling something when we're doing our calculations. And maybe that's the reason that, there, that, that this disagreement exists. Um, and so, I mean, from a physical perspective, this is very exciting, but also from a, you know, like a, a scientific perspective, it's exciting because I guess the public gets to see this disagreement playing out in real time. And so it's, it's like a live demo of how science should be done. So what have we come to now? So to summarize, we have two very good ways of measuring the expansion rate of the universe. One using kind of nearby things, so galaxies near the Milky Way by measuring Cepheids and supernovae. And then we have one which involves looking at the relic radiation left over from the Big Bang, cosmic microwave background. And so this is stuff, observations uh, of something that happened uh, at very early times in the universe. And those two things don't agree at all. Maybe it's because we've got our theory of physics wrong. Maybe it's because we've done the measurements wrong. So let's check those two possibilities out. Um, the first one, uh, you know, is our theory of cosmology wrong? Um, you don't need to take anything in off this off this slide really at all, other than the fact that lots and lots of people have, have got excited about this and tried to, to explain this using uh, uh, different theories of physics, right? There are something like 150 or 200 or maybe even more papers that have been written on this over the last few years because uh, it's so kind of captivating. But you can basically like bin all of these attempts up in, in, in four different pots like I have on here. Uh, because, say, for example, you have energy, uh, 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 ideas where you change this dark energy, this kind of repulsive, uh, weird stuff that looks like anti-gravity in the late universe. So you can tweak the form of that, put it in your theory, but then it turns out it just doesn't work. It doesn't change uh, the, the rate that you find from looking at the cosmic microwave background uh, to agree with the, the Cepheids and the supernovae. You can come up with theories so here, these ones involve adding neutrinos, adding different funky types of neutrinos, stuff like that. You can come up with theories where in some very small part of the allowed uh, types of that theory, you can, you can get agreement between the, the cosmic microwave background and the, and the Cepheids and supernovae, um, but the, they're too fine tuned 
basically they're kind of unnatural versions of that theory um and so they they, they don't they're not satisfying explanations of, of this disagreement there are some attempts that are that are even funkier that are that are just preliminary and there are different types of of, of theories where you can um change the Planck value the Planck uh, the cosmic microwave background derived expansion rate um so that it's in agreement with the, the distance ladder but it's at the cost of breaking something else you know uh, you you would say that there are now too many galaxies in the universe you would predict that there are many many more galaxies in the universe for example than, than we actually see when we do galaxy surveys all of that is to basically say that nobody has found a modification to our best theory of cosmology that that um that explains this disagreement in a satisfying way and so then you must say well then, it, then it's got to be problems with the data right um but unfortunately that's not necessarily obviously true either lots of people including some uh people like me have have gone through the the different observations that uh, that, that that comprise these two measurements and try to do things our own way so say for example on the cepheid and uh, supernova distance ladder side of things you know, throwing out weird looking Cepheids that look like they might not be exact standard candles, looking at supernova using infrared measurements instead of optical measurements, talking about whether or not the brightness of supernova depends on the type of galaxy that they live in, things like that. And again, no one has come up with a compelling explanation for why this measurement would disagree with this one. And people have done the same on the cosmic microwave by background side of things, they've used different observatories so things like WMAP um, and ground-based observatories like the South Pole Telescope or the Atacama Cosmology Telescope they've looked at different kind of splits of the observations by Planck because it does it at multiple different wavelengths and again no one has has basically shifted any of these values so that they're in agreement with each other and so we're stuck basically the two best ways of measuring this expansion rate completely disagree. Uh, we don't know how to change our theory to, to make them agree. And we don't know how to, um, to, to change, uh, to, to uh, analyze our data in a different way uh, to make them agree either. So what can we actually do? What can we do? Well, the one thing that we can do is we can, we can basically verify this, right? We can take completely different observations and we can look at the, the kind of local universe again, the galaxies near us, but using different objects. So instead of Cepheids or supernova, try and find something else that tells us about the distances to these galaxies. And we can again, look at something in the earlier universe, so not the cosmic microwave background, but something else maybe, and try and figure out uh, whether or not that comes up with a, a theory dependent measurement of the of the expansion rate that is different to the cosmic microwave background so we're looking for verification here and there's lots of ways of doing it what i'm showing on here is just things that you can ask me about later so we can use the typical distances between galaxies which is what, what i'm trying to show over here to figure out the expansion rate in a way again that depends on the theory of the universe it turns out when you do that you get something that agrees with the cosmic microwave background quite well and so actually, I think if you ask most cosmologists, they would agree that this early universe, so theory dependent way of measuring the, of the, the expansion rate, I think is, is quite firm. But on the nearby side of things, you can do lots of different things. So instead of using, using Cepheids, you can use Myra variables, use red giant branch stars. Something that's really cool is this, where you use multiple images of, of the same quasar, right? So you have something incredibly dense in a way like a galaxy cluster which bends the light around so you get multiple images of, of quasars that are very distant and you can look for uh, uh basically delays between you know flares in these quasars to figure out the the expansion rate which is super cool um, but the one that i'm going to be talking about uh it involves these things which is a, a mergers between neutron stars in, in binary system. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the for the rest of the talk. Uh, I don't know exactly how much time I've got left because I've got a thing covering up my timer, but hopefully I've got time to talk about that. Um, so uh, 
let's just go back to this this distance ladder for now um, because it's our best way of measuring the expansion rate from, from kind of galaxies that are near to the Milky Way. The big problem with it is the fact that we have to have a, a ladder, right? So we have to observe two different types of standard candles. We have to observe them in three different environments, right? One nearby, one where there's both types of standard candles, one where there's they're very distant. Now imagine if we could just uh, measure those distances in one step, then we would get rid of all of this uh, kind of calibration that we have to do. We would get rid of one population of, of standard candles. We could do this in a way that is much, much cleaner that hopefully would be a bit more convincing. Um, and so that's essentially what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, so we can we can basically do this and we can do this as of uh, the last few years because of discoveries made by um, the LIGO and Virgo uh, gravitational wave observatories. So what am I showing you here? Well, this is an animation of two neutron stars uh, orbiting each other. So these neutron stars, right, they are stellar remnants, right? So the, the, the star has died and it's, it's, it's the kind of collapsed core of that star where everything is crushed down till it's just neutrons. And what they're doing here, um, I always time this wrong, so I start talking about it when it's, when it's dead. Uh, let's get that back if we can. What they're doing is they're spinning around each other, right? So they're in a binary system. And at some point soon, they, they will start emitting something, right? These waves that are traveling out. And what that's showing is, is gravitational waves, okay? Um, and so these gravitational waves are being emitted and because that basically means that the, that the system is losing energy, these things get closer and closer together and the, the waves, uh, the gravitational waves that they emit get stronger. So it gets faster and faster and faster. You can think of it as like a figure skater pulling their arms and spinning faster and faster. And eventually these things merge and explode in, in something called a kilonova. Um, but the great thing is, is that these, these gravitational waves that, the, that these neutron stars are emitting allow us to find distances to these merger events using just one step and assuming gravity, uh, general relativity only. So this is a, a really, really clean way of getting distances uh, to actually quite distant objects. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides talking about gravitational waves and how we measure them. Um, so what are gravitational waves? Well. Uh, hopefully people are aware of, you know, the, the, the basic concept of general relativity where you have, um, you know, space, space time is like a rubber sheet, uh, where if you put heavy things on that rubber sheet, uh, so masses, they distort space time, right? I think everyone will have seen, you know, one of these rubber sheets where you drop a ball in it and you get this, this dip, and then it's that curvature of space time. That, that is basically gravity, right? So if you fire a little ball around that heavy ball, it will follow a curved path because the mass has, has, has changed the shape of space time. So you can then think of moving that mass around on that rubber sheet in the right way. Um, and if you do that in the right way, you can basically get these distortions to not just stay still, but to, to propagate away from the mass as a wave. And that's what's basically being shown here, where you have these two neutron stars orbiting each other, and they're causing these distortions in space time, which then ripple away off into space. And if you look carefully, you can see that the, the, the height of those, of those distortions changes, it drops off with distance. Um, and in fact, it goes down as one over the distance. And so if you know how big the amplitude is here, you can measure how big it appears to be over here and figure out the distance to that merger event. Now, what does that look like, you know, in, 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 in the detector or if one of these gravitational waves comes towards you? Well, this is my favorite animation that I found <laughs> for this talk. This is an incredibly vastly exaggerated look of, of, of what these gravitational waves do as they, as they go through um, space. So what one basically does is it will, you know, it, it basically squeezes things in one way and squashes them another way, and then it squashes them the original way and squeezes them. So it does this kind of motion. And so what it does is it passes past Earth, is it basically squeezes it one way and then squashes it and squeezes it and squashes it. And this is what's being shown here. Now, what does that mean in terms of trying to find these things? Well, um, it means that 
uh, it will change the lengths of, of, of things that you can measure, basically. So you can detect these gravitational waves if you can figure out the length of something and see if it's changing with time in a way that the gravitational wave would predict. And so we figured out how to do this um, thanks to an incredible amount of work by a lot of people. Um, but the kind of culmination of this is, has come recently um, with these detections made by the LIGO and Virgo um, observatories. And they do this using laser interferometry. So I'm going to show you very briefly how that works. But you can see the concept is in these buildings here, you have some lasers and some detectors and then you have these big long gigantic arms so uh, these are like four kilometers long where they basically fire a laser off down each of these things and you combine combine them in the middle to basically figure out if this arm length is changing and if this arm length is changing in a way that looks like a gravitational wave so if you kind of zoom into that the, the building what you see is you have a laser coming out here it's going to go through this beam splitter here which is going to send it off in two different directions right and it's going to go all the way down to the end of the arm and it's going to hit a mirror and bounce back and then when it comes back to the center it's going to hit this beam splitter again where it's going to be recombined and sent to a detector and now uh, what is going to happen is that these two uh, light rays, these two lasers are going to interfere with each other. And so if these, if the waves are exactly lined up, then they're going to combine together in a way that we call constructive interference. So you're going to get a bright spot on the detector. And if they don't line up, so if you have a peak in one and a trough in another, then you're going to get a dark spot. Um, and if you have a gravitational wave that is going to come through this detector, so down through the screen, what it's going to do is change these arm lengths in this way. So it's going to stretch one and squeeze one, and then it's going to squeeze the other and stretch the uh, whichever way around. Stretch and squeeze, stretch and squeeze. And so you're going to get this time dependent uh, signal in the detector. And just for, you know, you can figure out this is the, the way that the gravitational wave is squashing and squeezing. And so if you think of that going through the detector, it's going to extend one while it's squeezing the other arm, extend and then squeeze. So you can, you can basically see that it's going to change the arm lengths um, uh, in different ways, in a way that you can then detect in this, uh, this well, detector at the end of the day. And so, um, uh, the, the, the crazy thing here that is the most mind-blowing thing is that the, the, the changes in lengths that they're detecting here are equivalent to some tiny fraction of the width of a proton. It's, it's basically the same as, as changing the distance to Proxima Centauri by the width of a hair, which it, it's just mind-blowing that you can actually uh, even begin to detect changes in lengths like that, but, but they've done that now. So what does that mean in terms of the expansion? Um, well, to, to bring all this back together, uh, we have heavy objects that are orbiting each other. That turns out that that means that they're accelerating in a way that produces gravitational waves. Okay, We now know um, that we can detect these things using LIGO and Virgo. And we also know that the amplitude of these waves decays as one over the distance. And so we can determine um, the distance to these uh, to these merger events by uh, looking at the, the the detections that we make in in the LIGO and Virgo observatories. Now you might be shouting, "Oh, well, how do we know the intrinsic amplitude of these things? The true amplitude?" Well, it turns out that by looking at the time and frequency dependence of the of the detections that we make, we can figure out how how loud these things basically were in the first place. So we can get these detection uh, these distance measurements directly. Uh, from the gravitational wave data, which is really clean and, 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 and very cool. And because we can see these things out to hundreds of millions of light years away, you know, the motions of these objects are completely uh, dominated by the expansion. So we don't need to worry about the, the peculiar motions, you know, the, the attractions that these objects have to their local galaxies and things like that. The one thing that we need uh, then to get the expansion measurement is, is, is uh, redshift, right? Um, and the only way that we can get that, well, or the, the easiest way to get that is to just skip this video back and look at the fact that these things explode 
they visibly explode when they when they combine in something called a kilonova. And so if we can see one of these kilonovae on the sky uh, in, in normal light, right, or, or gamma rays or, or, or radiation like that, then we can figure out what galaxy they're in and figure out the redshift of that galaxy, then we have a distance and a redshift and we can get the expansion rate. And so thankfully we've been able to do this, we've been able to do this for one, one source now, I say we, it wasn't something that I did, but it's something that quite a large <laughs> portion of the astrophysics community did. And so these are the data that, that led to that discovery. So on the bottom here, we have data from uh, LIGO, gravitational waves. And what we're seeing here is this, is this is the detection. So this is signal in that detector and it goes whoop like this at zero seconds. So this is the time where the merger happened. This is a, something called a chirp. So it's a, it's a very uh, telltale signal that you get in gravitational waves from these merger events. And the really, really compelling thing here is that a few seconds after this merger event, Fermi satellite detected a burst of gamma rays. So beep right there. And these things, uh, this happened so close together in both terms of time and, and, uh, and like area on the sky that this basically triggered um, observations by almost every single telescope on the ground to try and find this um, kilonova event that, that, that accompanied it. Um, and so this is what, what they found. So um, LIGO and Virgo said that this is where they expected this thing to happen in the sky. Fermi said that the gamma rays came from somewhere in here. And so this was immediately, you know, extremely exciting that this might be one of these binary neutron star mergers. And so people basically covered this patch by looking with lots and lots of telescopes to see if something new had appeared compared to the, the old data. And the first team that found it was the Swope telescope where they found this kind of no name galaxy. What is it, NGC 4993, where this big blob suddenly appeared that wasn't there 20 days before. Um, and, and this was the, this kilonova, so this explosion uh, that, that happens when the, the neutron star merges. Um, actually, well, the neutron stars actually merge. Uh, so what does that mean in terms of the, the, the expansion itself? Well, when you take the, I'll try and get this back. When you take the redshift of this galaxy and you combine it from the um, distance that you get from these gravitational waves, you get a measurement of the expansion rate that looks like this. So this is the expansion rate and this is the most likely value. And we see that it peaks at something like 70, but there is an uncertainty of kind of about 10. So LIGO and Virgo would say that it's between 60 and 80. And that's not good enough to tell the difference. It's not good enough to verify anything at the moment because this green thing here shows the values that are okay with the, the Planck satellite. And these orange curves uh, bands here tell you the numbers that are okay with the Cepheids and supernovae. So it's not precise enough to, to, to say which one of these is right uh, just yet. But if we wait a few years, then uh, we should start detecting more and more of these things and we'll begin to know much better. So this is something that I've been working on quite a lot over the last few years. What I'm showing in this middle thing here is how if you add more and more detections of these objects, you can see how curves that look like this rapidly get narrower and narrower and narrower. And it turns out that if we detect maybe a hundred of these objects, which we should be able to get in, in the next kind of five or 10 years, um, then we should have a precision on the expansion rate measurement that is, that is good enough to tell the difference between these, um, between these two values to figure out which one is right and thereby figure out whether or not we need to add new physics um, or we were just making a mistake uh, with one of these measurements. So I've only got a couple more slides if that's okay. Um, and it's just to say that, that basically neutron stars aren't the only objects um, that exist in these binary systems uh, and that emit gravitational waves when they merge. So what this plot on the left-hand side here is showing is, so this is from LIGO and Virgo, and this is showing the types of objects that they've detected. So they've detected two mergers between neutron stars. So these are their little neutron star mergers here. So it's just showing kind of how heavy these things are that go in and then how heavy the objects that came out. 
So they think that, for example, this object, uh, this binary neutron star merger produced another neutron star. This one maybe produced a black hole. Um, but what you'll see is that you have a whole bunch of other objects up here. So these are black holes that they've detected. And they also have this one special thing in the middle where they think a neutron star merged with a black hole in order to produce another black hole. This is a cool thing because one, you, it allows you to get artists to produce figures like this, where you have a neutron star merging with a black hole and it's just like the Hollywood movie. But um, this is interesting from a scientific perspective because uh, the um, the kind of uh, amplitude, so the, uh, yeah, the amplitude of the gravitational waves goes up with the masses of the object involved. And because the black holes are much more massive than the neutron stars, these things should be louder. And so neutron star black hole mergers should be um, much louder than neutron star neutron star mergers. We can see them further away. Um, they're basically just easier to detect. And um, we might still expect them to produce light because if this neutron star is shredded before it gets swallowed by the black hole, you would expect it to emit a lot of light. And so we can get um, distances from the gravitational waves and we might be able to see these things using telescopes uh, because of the disruption. And then we can assign them to galaxies, figure out those galaxies redshift to get um, expansion rate measurements. I showed using some simulations that again, if we have uh, around a hundred of these things, we should be able to measure um, the expansion rate to uh, kind of uh, uh, like uh, one percent precision, which is good enough to to then figure out whether or not the cosmic microwave background is right, or the or this value of seventy three that we get from from the Cepheids and supernova is right. And then just one last thing that I wanted to say was that if you look at this uh, picture more closely, you'll see that the vast majority of events that LIGO has found, which are all of these blue things, these are mergers between two black holes, right? That didn't involve a neutron star at all. And so this is what I'm showing in this animation on the right hand side here. So this is two black holes orbiting each other and they eventually spiral together and they will merge and then they'll emit these waves, which is what's kind of wobbling the background. These are much, much easier to detect, as you can see. LIGO and Virgo have detected something like 10 times more of these than anything involving a neutron star. That's simply because they're, well, two reasons that they, they probably occur more frequently in the first place, but they're much easier to, to detect. The only problem is, as you can see from this animation, we don't really expect them to produce any light. So we can figure out their distances by looking at the gravitational waves, but it's very hard to figure out a redshift to them um, because uh, they don't emit any light. We can't do all of this follow-up to figure out what galaxies they're in. So can we still actually use them to, to measure the expansion? Well, it turns out that we, we, we can, and we can do that because um, the, the gravitational waves not only tell us the distance, but they also tell us um, whereabouts on the sky this merger must have happened. And so what I'm showing here is, is this white curve here. This is some patch of the sky for a binary black hole merger um, that LIGO and Virgo saw. And it's basically saying, we think that this merger event happened here. So it's maybe 10 degrees across in our own deck. And what we can do is we can take telescopes and we can try and find every single galaxy that is in that patch on the sky that has some kind of appropriate distance. And then we can basically play a game of saying, well, what if the merger was in this galaxy? It would have this distance and this galaxy has this redshift. So that would give us some specific expansion rate. And then we can go to the next galaxy and the next galaxy and the next galaxy and go through this full catalog to try and figure out all of the possible expansion rates that, that, that there might have been. And then you basically just need to, uh, to, to average over those um, in order to, uh, to find out an estimate of the overall expansion rate. So people have started doing this. This is some data from uh, Marcel Suarez Santos paper uh, from the Dark Energy Survey. Um, right now, the, the measurements of the expansion rate that you get are very uh, imprecise. So you get kind of 50% precision. Um, but because these things happen much more frequently than the neutron star mergers, um, this kind of sample rapidly builds up. You maybe, you maybe need around a thousand of these objects to get to the required precision. Um, uh, but you will also, with better experiments, be able to see these things 
of being able to confine these things to much smaller patches on the sky, which then means, you know, following up to try and get all of the galaxies is, is a much easier job. And so this is the, the sky map that, um, that, that LIGO and Virgo were able to produce for a neutron star merger. And this is much smaller. And this is basically showing this same procedure being done for that merger where you go and you find all of the galaxies that are compatible with you know, the, the merger having taken place there. And as you can see with a much smaller patch, you can basically do this in a, in a, in a very controlled way and just go through and find every single galaxy on the sky. So anyway, that's, that's, that's I guess, the end of my ramblings. Um, hopefully what I've managed to convince you of is the fact that, you know, the measuring the expansion rate of the universe is interesting, but it's always been extremely hard and very controversial. And there's certainly no exception today. Um, we have many ways of measuring the expansion now, but our two best ways uh, completely disagree with each other. The fact that one of those measurements uh, depends on our theory of the universe's expansion um, potentially means that that theory is wrong, but it also potentially means that we've just done one of the measurements wrong. And um, so that's really exciting because it's potentially really strong evidence that we need to add new kind of physics to our theory of the universe. Um, but we don't know the answer to, uh, uh, we don't know the explanation right now, um, but hopefully our, our, we have many uh, other techniques that we can use to, to figure out which of these explanations is correct. And hopefully gravitational waves have a, a really strong role to play with that. Um, and so that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Fascinating. Thank you very, very much. That was really, really interesting. Thanks. And, and there are people already piping in with questions. Um, it's a pity. There's one down, downside about our online talks is you just can't, can't hear the rounds of applause from people. <laughs> I'm imagining rapturous applause, yeah. <laughs> so um, let's go to some of the questions. So we had some questions. Well, we've had a, a whole bunch, actually. So. Uh, from on YouTube, we had a question. Um, if you rewind the expansion, would there be a single point in space where it all started? And where would this be? This is from Oliver Hext. Yeah, right. So so that is the, the immediate consequence of it. If finding out that the universe is, is expanding now, you know, if that has always been the case, then yes, you know, you immediately can say, well, X years ago, uh, it would have occupied zero volume, right? And so, you know, that's the kind of concept of the of the Big Bang. Now, whether or not that actually happened uh, is is like a theoretical point. You know, actually, when you plug in a full cosmological theory, the expansion rate isn't constant. Um, but what we really think has happened is that uh, you know you you get back to a certain size of universe. And then something called uh, inflation happened where you went from like a really tiny volume of space and, and then you had this exponential expansion that, that kind of blew the universe up to like macroscopic scales. Um, it's not like an individual point though. This is, that's kind of true for our volume that we can see today, but it's also true of all other volumes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it gets a bit complicated and I'm gonna start using long words, but hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a notoriously tricky one to answer because um, yeah, actually I find things like uh, uh, expanding space time and even special relativity just really hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, there's uh, a question uh, from John Mar a couple of questions from John Murrell actually. Um, uh, one is uh, why does the strength of the gravitational wave fall over fall as one over distance ra rather than one over distance squared as the electromagnetic radiation does. My feeling was that it should fall as one over distance cubed as space and time is four dimensional. Yeah, right. So let's see if I can get this one right. So when you're, when you're measuring, um, when you're measuring like EM radiation, you are measuring like the intensity of something, right? And so that is, uh, you know, if you draw a bigger sphere, it has to be the same amount of intensity that's going out through bigger spheres, right? And so that that that's 
why that goes down as distance squared, right? Because it's the, it's the kind of surface area of that sphere. I think the explanation for, for gravitational waves is that instead of measuring the, the kind of intensity, you're measuring the actual amplitude of the waves uh, and the intensity is equal to the amplitude squared basically. And so, so you just take a square root of that. So you get the one over distance rather than one over distance squared. Yeah. Which is cool because it means that it's, it's easier. <laughs> It really is, yes. Yeah. Uh, also, Stephen King had exactly the same question. So, um, uh, John Morrow also had... The Stephen King. Well, let's say yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> oh, definitely. Big, yeah. big fan of your work. <laughs> um, John Morrow also had the question... Uh, the cosmological theories do not include magnetic fields. The observations presented at the WAS, WAS uh, recently showed that there are galactic scale magnetic fields and these presumably, uh, and there are presumably intergalactic fields. What impact do these have on cosmology? Right, so the on the one hand, the, the kind of galactic stuff turns up, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show this, the, the galactic stuff shows up in, um, uh, in the observations of the cosmic microwave background. And they are kind of easy to deal with because they look like the galaxy, right? Um, intergalactic stuff, honestly, I don't know what the answer there would be. I think you get some kind of, I don't think there's a huge impact on the, the, the cosmic microwave background and it, there wouldn't be any on the uh, gravitational waves as far as I can tell. Yeah, I suspect, yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely right. Um, Ian Robson uh, uh, asked a question. Great talk. Could you remind us just how many sigma the CMB and HST data are apart? Yep. How so, worried are people about blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. So they're about, well, it depends. So it very much depends on um, exactly which data sets you use, but there's something like four and a half sigma, right? So, um, you know, five sigma is this particle physics uh, kind of detection limit, right? So five, five sigma has this kind of mythical, well, not mythical, whatever, it's actually used as a, as, as a kind of decision point um, where something is, you know, definitely not just some weird fluctuation in your data. So it's something like four and a half sigma right now. Um, I think underestimating errors is, is probably definitely occurring possibly on both sides. Uh, on the... Um, just because you know you, you can always add complexity into your model uh, that would give you a bit more uncertainty. For for example, on the at least on the Cepheid and supernova side of things, there's lots of work goes into the data. You know you're trying to find stars in galaxies, and uh, there are chances. You know especially when you're looking at distant galaxies, um, you might have another star that's just in front or just behind it, just next to the Cepheid, and so you have these kind of blurring or blending. Um, uh, and crowding effects and you've got to account for them somehow and I mean the shoes team does a huge amount of work into figuring that out but it's, it's you know it's easy to see how that might be underestimated a little bit um, you also have potential impacts from uh, you know intrinsic properties of the standard candles so one of the big ones here is uh, so I showed a little bit of a simplified picture of the of the supernovae you can also get type 1a supernovae from just having two white dwarfs collide um, and those would presumably have a different intrinsic brightness if you are uh, picking out different types of, of type 1a supernovae um, in your different parts of the distance ladder then you can easily add you know error in there as well so for example you know if 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 in galaxies where you have cepheids and supernovae you always get one of those two types Whereas in your sample where you're just looking for the type 1a supernova, you have a mixture of both of those types. You could see how there would be a problem in there. Um, it, it's, I, would, I would expect that, that both measurements have their uncertainties uh, underestimated a bit, but it's, but it's kind of hard to imagine them being underestimated by, you know, like the factor of two or three that you actually really need. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there's, I, there's no way that that bit's true, I don't think. Yeah. Um, there'd have to be something more fundamentally wrong. It really has to be. It's, it's really intriguing. There was a paper by um, 
uh was it lynn and mac katie mac was one of them uh the authors a while ago and, and it was just this horrible great splodge of lots of different colors of overlapping ellipses error ellipses and they were they did that to show that the cephid calibration was a little bit off and you know you, you don't know that that's what's going on but uh, i looked at that and thought you know i'm just gonna let these people all just fight it out and and uh and and just uh keep an eye on that and i thought yeah the gaia data release is going to come along and i bet that's just going to sort it out and then the Gaia data release came along and no it did not sort it out <laughs> it's it's getting better though yeah it's very slightly but yeah. yeah oh it's really interesting um there was uh oh gosh we've got so many questions now i don't know how, how long can you stay around for uh, i'm all right for now don't worry all right for now okay um how old is the universe if the concept is 60 or 80 says simon bakewell i can send you an email with that answer <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't be able to pull that one out i can't, I can't do that off the top of my head sorry yeah, yeah. i mean i mean <laughs> yeah right exactly i don't honestly know if oh. um if 60 or 80 would um would be enough to you know encounter problems from um like uh, globular cluster ages things like that at oldest star limits um i don't think that's true but it's a good question sorry i can't answer it better yeah yeah uh i guess i guess it will scale as one over h naught yeah right exactly what the numbers are i yeah know. it's roughly speaking that yeah. but yeah um, yeah, ten percent different, kind yeah, of. Yeah. So, yeah. So, presumably, actually, the, the one of them would be problematic in terms of having observed stars and clusters that are, you know, mm. eleven billion years old or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, what will uh, uh, understanding the expansion rate of the universe tell us about how the universe might end? Says Alistair Barr. Right, that's a great question. So, so part of the shame of all of this is that um, that the cosmic microwave background and the Hubble constant or the expansion rate measurements they're they're really really complementary, which means that they're very good together in terms of um, telling us what the theory of the universe is. Right. So the 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 expansion rate thing is kind of one dimensional, right? It's just telling us how fast the universe is now, uh, expanding now. And, and that allows you to say something about the age because it's basically just one over the age. Um, the cosmic microwave background tells us so much more. It tells us how much you know stuff there is in the universe, how much normal matter, how much dark matter, how much dark energy. But it's fundamentally, it's a picture of the universe as it was like 14 billion years ago. If you have you know, a measurement at the beginning of the universe and a measure at the end of the universe, that's extraordinarily constraining about how the universe evolved in the middle and, and, and how it's going to evolve in the future. And so once you can get these things to agree with each other, the combined data set will be really, really constraining about, you know, how, uh, well, so specifically like the curvature of the universe. So whether it's flat, whether it's open or it's closed, but also, you know, what, um, what dark energy is going to do to the universe in the future? So, in combination with the co cosmic microwave background, it's it's really informative about how the universe is going to end. Mm. So, there are quite a few people asking about how dark matter and dark energy tie in into this work, and whether this could tell us something about dark energy. Right. Yeah. So, I will mark those as answered. So, Neil, Wabe, and Thomas Obitz and several others. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, bu, 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 bu. Which galaxy is farthest away without a redshift? Which galaxy is farthest away without oh. a redshift? Uh, it's well, uh, you kind of can't tell. Mm. I mean, we so we need a redshift to be able to figure out how how far it is away. I mean, if the question is how uh well so what the 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 um the the highest redshift objects that we've seen are, are kind of like high nines in terms of redshift mm -hmm. right and this is like basically looking back almost all of the all of the age of the universe um 
those things are not the galaxies that we're using in um, in the expansion rate measurements. I mean, in the expansion rate measurements, we're looking much, much closer to home. So this is kind of hundreds of millions of light years uh, rather than kind of billions of light years. Absolutely. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, scrolling through, um, uh, uh, someone called Drozd has asked, does the universe have an edge or is it infinite? Or am I talking rubbish? No, you're not. Actually, I no, say. you're not. No. But I might talk rubbish in response. <laughs> I mean, so so essentially we have, the, there is, there's an edge in terms of, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, we only have access to a certain portion of the universe because of the finite speed at which light travels, right? And specifically the fact that dark energy is now causing the universe to ex expand away again. It means that basically now, uh, currently, it's, it's basically the, 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 the largest portion of the universe that we'll ever be able to see. Um, but that doesn't mean that the universe doesn't exist further away, right? And so, the, you know, there's reason to believe that, that the universe extends far beyond that. Um, but then, I mean, it's a great question because you start then descending into like multiverse theory and different types of multiverses. And so, you know, we technically live in a multiverse because we, we, we can only see one patch of, of, of the universe as a whole. And there are other patches that are separate from us that might be completely different. But then you get to start talking about, you know, quantum theories where you might actually have separate universes um, of, of many different types um, that, you know, we can't, you know, that aren't just simple copies of us, that, but, but that might actually be, um, you know, completely separate entities. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it, there's no reason to believe that there's an edge. Mm. Uh, indeed. Uh, Brian Walker is asking, is the universe destined to keep expanding or is there a point at which it will stop and then reduce back to a big crunch? Right. So so the current uh, the current understanding is that there is so much dark energy in the universe. And this, this comes from the cosmic microwave background experiments. There's so much dark energy in the universe that, that, that basically the universe is going to expand away forever. Mm. And that that expansion is just going to get faster and faster and bleaker and bleaker until, you know, it's just our local group and then it's just us and Andromeda and then it's just us. And... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve Harvey has asked, how isotropic is the universe? Uh, very. <laughs> uh, well, so it's funny, isn't it, right? I mean, well, so... Um, uh, there are uh, very strong constraints on on how different the universe could look in different directions um, from uh, again from observations of the cosmic microwave background. So I wrote a paper with uh, so it's led by Daniela Sade, who's in uh, last time I checked was in Nottingham, and Andrew Ponson and Harania, who are both at um, Harania Pires uh, at UCL, and you can basically uh, test for um, you know, large anisotropies, like preferred directions in the universe. So basically looking for directions in which the universe seems to be expanding at different rates. And, and there's no evidence for that. You can put really, really tight constraints on, on any of those things. So you can say, you know, that the universe is, is, is very isotropic. It looks very isotropic. Mm. Indeed. Um, uh, Jack Martin has asked, how long was inflation? And how do you know? How do you know? Yeah, well, he asked, Personally. how was it measured? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, in terms of time, like a tiny fraction of a second, um, we don't know how long it, it went on for. Um, uh, it's, it's a, that's a big, long answer to the question. Yeah. Uh, the way, uh, I mean, inflation was was first proposed as a way to explain why the universe looks spatially flat and doesn't have things like monopoles in it. Um, uh, and, and to explain the fact that, you know, the universe looks the same on all of these, uh, on all scales, basically. Um, in order for that to happen, you basically need it to have gone on just long enough or long enough. Um, 
uh, but there's no necessary, you know, you need a fundamental theory of, of inflation to, to, to say, you know, what the likely duration of, of that, that process is. I mean, fundamentally, it's a tiny fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. um, but there are theories that predict that it is currently going on in the multiverse right now and will do so eternally. And it only ever ends in small pockets, in which case you get universes like our own. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a, there's a non-answer to the question. <laughs> good as anyone can give, I think. Um, so, um, um, someone called Malcolm has asked, does the expansion of the universe affect time as it does space? Could that confuse observations? Uh, so, like, I, I mean, yeah. In terms of, I mean, you have the, 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 you know, all of the effects of relativity baked into these calculations. Mm. Um, so, yes, but it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be affecting these calculations, basically, if that makes sense. Exactly. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of um, uh, looking at the light curves of, si of supernovae, and actually they seem to slow down at high redshift. Kind of that's a, it, a one plus z and time delay. Yeah, no, right. So you have all of these these you know redshifts and time dilations and things like that in there. Um, yeah. And so all you know, for example, in in, in all of the uh, uh, um, binary neutron star observations and, and calculations that I was talking about there, you know, all of that stuff is built in. Um, but no, it's not expected to to be able to explain the discrepancy. Exactly right. Uh, indeed, yes. Uh, so there was a wild question on on YouTube, and I, I'm a bit afraid to ask this one because it's it's so hard. Uh, uh, question: Has the Hubble constant been calculated using loop quantum cosmology? And if so, how does this value compare with other values? I have no idea. Uh, Sorry, I don't. I don't know. It might be one of these. Um, it might be one of these 150, 200 theory papers that 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 I referenced. I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure if if it can be done, it will have been done. And the fact that you haven't read a newspaper article saying that that's the solution, yeah. would my inference would be <laughs> that it doesn't fix the problem. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But, um, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, it's the speculative physics is, 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 well, it's wild and fun, but quite hard to prove. It's true, but if it made a concrete prediction, then, then that would be excellent. That would be uh, super, yeah. 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 Um, Nathaniel is asking, will the James Webb Space Telescope be involved in measuring the expansion rate of the universe? Um, do you know what? I don't, I don't honestly know. I, um, I don't necessarily think so because of... Uh, how you know how pointed it has to be I mean it has incredible resolution right but it but it I don't think it's going to be much use in this setting yeah I, honestly I don't I don't know I don't I don't really work on JWST I mean part of the problem here is that HST's days are numbered right and at some point it's going to fail and, and come crashing down to earth and and part of the you know the work that, that the shoes team is doing now is like trying to get as as much data out of hsd as possible because you know everything's built on it at the moment mm. and the more i mean the 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 fundamental uh, kind of flaw on the pre precision of their measurements is how many galaxies they have with cepheids and a supernova in so they're basically trying to get as many of them as possible before hst dies mm. um yeah, I mean, mm. uh, I don't, I don't honestly know that much about the future of um, uh, the future of those mm. measurements in terms of ways of getting Cepheids uh, I, to to blather on a bit. You know, one of the things that I showed earlier, one of the plots had this. TRGB method on it you know there, there are other ways of doing these distance ladders that use different astrophysical objects and one of the most promising ones is by just looking at the the red giant branch in, in galaxies um, and finding out the tip of it because that corresponds to a physical thing happening in in certain stars right it's like the helium flash um, again that's a thing that you might expect to be a standard candle and it is it's a, it's a good standard candle and so people are starting to use that more now. Um, 
so there are you know there are there are ways of getting around the like HST going offline. Um, and ideally, you know, these these gravitational wave methods would would uh, would kind of take over the local uh, measurements because, I mean, the way that so uh, ramble ramble ramble. As these things get more sensitive, we have this volume effect, the same volume effect that I was talking about with the HST. You know, you make your gravitational wave detectors twice as sensitive, and they get eight times as many objects. And you know, there's plans to make these gravitational wave detectors way more sensitive. And so we should be in the regime of getting, you know, thousands of these things happening on a yearly basis, to the point where you have to care about them overlapping with each other. And so, you know, this is one of those weird fields where, you know, five years ago we didn't see anything. And in five years' time, you might have thousands of these things uh, in a way that's really exciting for these measurements, the expansion rate. But like ideally, this would all be done and dusted in five or ten years' time. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me, there's another question here, Neil Stewart asking, am I right to think that the European Space Agency plans a space gravity telescope? And if so, will this be a significant? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, 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 so, so Lisa, right? Mm. So Lisa is, yeah, instead of having, you know, the, the two arms, you basically have three detectors in space mm. uh, that, that have lasers between them, um, and then that like goes around in, in the orbit around with Earth, uh, and then that can detect gravitational waves. Um, so the, the big thing there is because the arm lengths are much longer, it's sensitive to different, um, different frequencies of oscillations. And so it's more sensitive to much larger systems. So like, um, what is, uh, I can't remember if Lisa is, um, you know, supermassive black holes mm. or it's more the the inflation. Well, it's supermassive black holes, right? Mm. Um, yes, supermassive black holes. And so, so you're you're talking about mergers between, like, you know, the the, the black holes at the centers of galaxies rather than neutron star, neutron star, binary black hole mergers. Um, I haven't actually seen a prediction from how well Lisa could uh, measure the expansion rate, but you're talking about much larger things at much larger distances. So, and given the relevant time scales, again, I would expect the, the hopefully, <laughs> hope the question to be answered by the like terrestrial scale, you know, interferometers rather than the space scale mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. Lisa. But Lisa is like amazing. I mean, it's lasers in space, so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> these experiments are just just amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, you said like a hair's breadth to the distance to Albus. Uh, yeah, there's this. Yeah. So th there was a question from Linda Sadiq. Um, when people talk about new physics, what's actually meant? New laws of physics, new phenomena, new ways of experimenting. Uh, right. Well, lots of different things. Um, so, uh, so many of the, uh, the 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 theories that I flashed up on that little slide were adding a thing to what we normally have. So, the so the standard model of cosmology right now is something called lambda CDM, right? Where lambda is a cosmological constant, CDM stands for cold dark matter. Um, so, we basically have a cosmological constant it's called dark matter, and normal matter and three neutrinos. So you can add new physics by adding more neutrinos, uh, more specific types of neutrinos, so like sterile neutrinos that would be much heavier, but would interact much less. Um, people talk about funky forms of dark matter, uh, you know, pictures where you have dark uh, energy that has, that, uh, has kind of time dependent behavior. Um, early dark energy. So this is dark energy that doesn't show up now, uh, but showed up in the early universe. You might have things like interactions between the dark energy field and the dark matter particle. But then, yeah, right, you then have questions like the one about loop quantum cosmology, where, you know, this is much more fundamental change to the model. You know, it's like a different theoretical model. It's a <clears throat> attempt to join together GR and uh, quantum mechanics. So, I mean, it's a great question. It, 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 it can mean anything. Uh, mm. Where I have used it recently, it typically means, you know, adding something to the current standard cosmology, mm. adding a particle. Right? 
adding a field. Mm. <coughs> well, it's now uh, just gone uh, three thirty. Okay. So, which <laughs> I've been stunned by the, the number of questions. I think um, uh, at this point, I should probably draw it to a close. But we will try and answer some of the questions on the uh, in the Zoom uh, as well, so people can get some answers. Um, uh, at this point, we normally have a 15 minute break or so, I think, and uh, so then people can like have a cup of break, get themselves a cup of tea, whatever you like, and, um, and then we uh, reconvene for uh, Dave Eagle and, and Robin. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Stephen. That was really interesting. It's, it's oh. such an ex exciting and interesting topic. Oh, it's my pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Brilliant. So uh, Robin, are you there? Yep. Hello. Yep. Indeed. So, how about we can reconvene at uh, three forty-five? I make it three thirty-one at the moment. So, does that sound all right to everybody? Time Perfect. for a cup of tea and whatever else you may feel <laughs> the need for. <laughs> uh, so, we'll stay live, and the and, and the, the the screen will be here. So, you just return whenever you want. And thank you very much to Stephen. And sorry we couldn't answer all those questions. And if you're watching on YouTube. Um, we, we had a record attendance, and Stephen Feeney might like to know this, we had a record attendance for this meeting. Um, we filled up the 100 places on Zoom straight away uh, before we even started the meeting, and we've never done that before. And at the maximum, I think there were 85 watching on YouTube, and no doubt there will be more uh, watching the recording. So you really dragged them in today. That was fantastic stuff. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you wanted to email me any of the questions, I'd be happy to to try and ping well, some. Maybe we can um, do some type in some answers on the Q and A while we're um, while we're in the break. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but uh, yeah, I've, I've I've got to go now. Sorry, yeah, okay, uh, but well, but yes, if you wanted to forward any of them on to yeah, me, but, well, I've anyway. got a note of them. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, so okay. we'll resume at three forty-five. Indeed. See you um, soon, folks. So I will keep doing that if you don't mind while uh, uh, while yep. you're talking. Yeah, you, you do that. Um, so... and, and I'll hand over to you. Right. OK, thank you very much. Right. I'm going to be talking about, let me see if I can share the right screen. How about that one? There we go. Right. OK, this is what's up for the next few months. Now, it's quite a dead time in some ways because I know my screen isn't changing. There we go. Um, we are running out of planets. We've had a wonderful appearance of Jupiter, Saturn and Mars over the last few months. And now we're left in terms of bright planets anyway, with the planet Mars. Now, OK, this is just not intended to be a, a, a close up view of the planet, but it shows you what you would see looking through binoculars or whatever. A very strong and right, very strongly red and bright object. Now getting down down to the western sky, but nevertheless still quite high up. And it is at this point in the appearance of Mars, and in, in, uh, well after opposition, the, the opposition was back in October, uh, three months ago, pretty well, that Mars puts on a has a sort of racing match with the Earth. <clears throat> of course, we're on an inside orbit to Mars, and so we're going faster in our orbit around the Sun. But Mars is gamely trying to catch up with us, but it can never really catch up with us. Nevertheless, it stays in the evening sky for an enormously long time after opposition. <clears throat> so it gets we're getting further and further away from it. People say it's getting more distant. In fact, we are pulling away from it all the time. And it's now down to really quite small. It's only a about five or so arc seconds across, which is tiny, really, in comparison with what it was at maximum, about 20 arc seconds. Nevertheless, people are still being able to, to observe it. And here's a wonderful image taken by, um, by Mar Martin Lewis, uh, St Albans, of the planet uh, just a couple of weeks ago on the 15th of January. Um, uh, diameter then was nine arc seconds. I think over the next month it will be going down to, uh, I didn't check the date, the, the diameter now, but it will be about four or five arc seconds before too long at all. But nevertheless, if you've got a, the right equipment, you can still see uh, some quite reasonable detail on the planet. And look at the detail on Sirtis Major there. That is still showing 
quite a remarkable view. And most of us, had we got a picture like that, would be, even at opposition, would be really pleased. <clears throat> Notice also, Mars is around a quadrature at the moment. That is, it's roughly between 90 degrees between the, the distance between the Earth, the Sun, and Mars. And although we can never see uh, Mars at half phase, we're getting on for it there. It's it's quite gibbous, if, as we would say, if we were looking at the moon. And you can see quite a lot of the shadow there. This is most notable. I haven't got the picture, but this really comes into its own when the fastest volcanoes are on the limb. And you can actually, at this time, uh, if using the, the imaging techniques that people have these days, <clears throat> you can actually see the shadows from the fastest volcanoes. And that we could do this now is extraordinary, considering what even 20 or so years ago, you re required a, an enormous telescope on the mountain top to be able to do that. But to be able to do this sort of imaging from a back garden in St Albans is absolutely amazing. And um, the, as I say, it shows the <clears throat> real advances that we've got in webcams these days, what we call webcams. They're basically video cameras, quite uh, quite simple cameras. That the, uh, the, the, they're not all that expensive, but Martin's telescope is a very beautifully constructed telescope and but nevertheless it does uh, it's still an amateur telescope and to do that from ground level or sea level in effect i know st albans isn't by the sea but compared with the mountaintop observatories it is so that's remarkable but mars as i say is the only bright planet around at the moment we have uranus uh, not far from mars in the sky neptune is getting a bit close to the sun to observe at the moment <clears throat> but um later on as i say Later on in the year, Mars will still be with us. And around March, it will be close to the Pleiades. This is a picture I took a few years ago showing Mars close to the Pleiades. And um, uh, that, that is the sort of thing we can look forward to, a great photo opportunity, as we call it, Mars photobombing the Pleiades. This is a picture I took just a few nights ago. In fact, this is a frame from a, a video which I might put online if I get the chance. Um, you can see the moon was uh, up in Taurus there. <clears throat> and we're really into the winter skies at the moment. In some ways, one of the best times of year, we've got the most recognisable constellations. Um, uh, we've got uh, Orion there. We've got Taurus in the upright. Uh, you can't see the Pleiades there. And later on, we've got... Um, uh, Gemini and we've got Cancer and we've got um, we've got uh, Leo and so it is a great time of year to get some astronomy done and of course the Orion Nebula there you, you can see if ever you have not seen any of you have not seen the Orion Nebula this shows you how to find it find the three stars in the belt of Orion and directly below the center one at least um, it's below if, if you regard this as the center line of Orion. Directly below that, there is the Orion Nebula, one of three stars there, three objects there. And that is really well worth looking at through binoculars. This is the sort of view, not quite, that you might get. It's very difficult to take a photograph, which uh, there's a bunch of a tree getting in the way there. Um, take a photograph which actually resembles the view you would get through binoculars, and people might expect the central part of the Orion Nebula to be burnt out that it is there. But in fact, all nebulae, even globular clusters and that sort of object, <clears throat> which appear burnt out in the middle of their uh, nebulosity, they are much more misty when you see them through binoculars or a telescope. No telescope or binocular that you can get. There is no optical instrument by itself without electronic aid that will show you a nebula or a galaxy or a globular cluster looking as bright as it does in a photograph. It's because of the nature of our eyes compared with the, um, the imaging system which we use. So that's the Orion Nebula. So starting with Orion there, which <clears throat> you will re all recognize, I'm sure. And as you know, the Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky there. Um, this is taken the, the, from Stellari. I'm showing the sky at about oh, 11 o'clock at night uh, or a bit earlier in um, in February and March, and this talk really covers the three months. And over this side, over to the left, over in the southeast there, we have the constellation of Leo. At the moment, it is a bit more on, on its, its back as it's rising in the sky. 
but you will recognize Leo very strongly, very easily recognized from, from its shape. And uh, Leo is the place where I want you to look for the next object, because as I say, no bright planets around, but what we have got is the asteroids to look at. Now, if you're familiar with pictures like this, which show you the asteroids, you've got the bright planets there, and uh, you've got all these asteroids, you, you think, how come I can't see these asteroids? And we had a question actually from a new member the other day, I don't know if she's watching, um, say, how can I observe the asteroid belt? Very good question. But you might think from looking like that, that, that this picture, that they would be all over the sky. And indeed, in some ways they are. Uh, here's the view that I showed you, uh, well, Leo there, and I've got um, all these little blue dots on this picture are, in fact, asteroids. They are minor planets, and you think, well, how come I've never noticed them all? And in this case, I've just taken the first thousand asteroids, or ten thousand asteroids, and allowed them to be displayed on the map. But that is a bit misleading, because those asteroids are, and most of those are really faint. If we take the first hundred asteroids, this is the, 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 the same view. And these are the ones that are particularly bright at the moment because they are uh, roughly uh, opposite the sun in the sky. And so they're at opposition. So that's when they're at brightest in the, the southern part of the sky. And you can see there are, well, maybe a couple of dozen of them there. And those are the, the, the some of the brightest asteroids. But if you look at the brightness of those, when you check the magnitude, they're about 12th, 13th magnitude, most of those. Now, if you look to see those that are visible with binoculars, you just get one, which is the one I want to tell, tell you about now, which is minor planet 4, Vesta. And it's in Leo at the moment. It's coming up to opposition in a couple of months' time, about the first week in uh, March. And you, you don't need to try and memorize its position here because I've put a finder chart on the SBA website, popastro.com, and you'll see there's a news story about finding Vesta uh, with the jokey title, Strike a Light, it's Vesta. Um, those of you who will uh, right age will remember lots of boxes and matches with Swan Vestas on the on the front. Actually, it's not a complete coincidence because Swan was the name of the company. I looked it up. Swan was the name of the company making the matches, and Vesta was the Roman god of the hearth, and not so much fire, but the hearth and family. And so Vesta, that's where we get the name from, and so that's why the matches were called that. So um, that's why. Vesta and Swan Vestas have the same name. So let's go in a bit closer. Here we are. This is the view of, well, looking at the sky tonight, it, uh, right out here, it doesn't look very good, but I think further north in the, in the country, you may get clear skies tonight. In which case, have a look at Leo. And this map is, is online on the SBA website, shows you Leo. This circle here is the um, field of view of that's a five degree field of view, roughly the same field of view as binoculars. So you can get the the idea that if you look through binoculars, and there is Vesta tonight, uh, then you should three should see three stars. If you're looking between that one, it's a nebula, and that one, which memory is a Zeta Orion, or maybe that Zeta. Anyway, um, you can see that those stars quite easily with binoculars. Go between them, and this these stars are actually should be roughly about the same brightness as Vesta, those will be fainter. And the magnitude's there, 6.7 at the moment, and it's getting brighter as it gets towards opposition, as I say, around the first week in March. So around the 6th of March, you should find uh, Vesta up, uh, quite easy to find in the bowl of, uh, in the centre of Leo there, and moving through into April, when it gets, starts to fade again. So that's how to find the minor planet Vesta, Quite often minor planets are difficult to look for. It's the only bright one in the night sky at the moment, so it's worth having a look for. And if you take photographs over a period of time, you should be able to see it moving. You should not be able to see anything. That it, if you look at Vesta through binoculars or even a telescope, it will look just like any other star. So you really need to look to, to be sure on more than one night and you'll see that it's moved slowly. Uh, Paul Sutherland took a photograph of the planet uh, uh, let's just, let just get you orientated again. There's the star De Nebula, and this is the body of, of Leo here. Now, to move on to his photograph, that's De Nebula, 
and there is the uh, those bright stars of the body there and there's those three stars I showed you this was taken a few nights ago on the 18th and just go back again there are those three there it is tonight and there it was a few nights ago so it's moving in that direction so that shows you what you should be looking for to look for Vesta so that is something to look forward to the next over the next month or two keep an eye on Vesta and, and how it moves uh, we don't have any predicted bright objects no comets that I'm aware of we may get a comet called Comet Leonard towards the end of the year but that's some time to go yet of course and um, the only meteor shower coming up is the Lyrids in April just a couple of days before our next meeting on the 22nd uh, the meeting on the 24th uh, so we'll send out a, a newsletter about that so that's all I've got to say there we are I'll stop my screen share and now um, I, I suppose I might as well uh, go on to, to uh, introduce Dave Eagle who is our uh, technical guy in the background he's been keeping an eye on YouTube and keeping an eye on what's going on and of course he runs the virtual astronomy meetings that go on every is it every couple of weeks now or every week now Dave the first and the third Tuesday of the month right at 7 p.m. okay so so the next meeting is this coming Tuesday right so you're you're free to plug what's coming up and um we haven't had a talk about the moon recently you'll know that um in, if you keep an eye on your popper astronomy, Dave wrote a very nice article about Mare Oriental uh, a few issues ago, and that might have prompted you to have a look at that object on the limb of the moon. So Dave is going to give us a talk about a tour around the moon. So I'll hand over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Robin. Does that come up OK? Just yep. checking. Yep, excellent. OK, well, thanks so much for inviting me um, this afternoon to uh, give everybody a tour around the moon because it's we're right in the middle of the 50th anniversary of the uh, Apollo missions. And of course, tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 14 after Apollo 13 um, had the accident uh, earlier last year, 50 years ago. So it's quite timely that uh, we talk about the moon and I've, I've looked at the moon as one of those things that every time it comes around it spoils your deep sky observing because and comets and that's what I'm principally interested in but over the past few years I've warmed a bit more to the moon and I've started to enjoy it far more than I have over um, a good number of years so uh, it's a good time to show people some of the features that I've started to enjoy as I've got into it of course you know the news is full of the red moon blood moon etc so which drives us absolutely mad but if you can catch the moon as it's rising or setting it does produce absolutely lovely colors and if the atmosphere is right it goes all strange shapes as well so that's something to uh, that's quite nice to look out for and this was where it was just below Jupiter so this was Jupiter some months ago um, as it was rising um, so that was quite a nice uh, catch there and of course, when it appears in the evening sky or is disappearing in the morning sky, is how thin a crescent can you spot? So that's always a challenge to see how thin you can catch the moon. I've seen it a lot thinner than this from the UK, but this one was cheating. This was uh, taken from the Seychelles. And of course, the angle of the ecliptic is much higher up than it is from the UK. So you do stand a chance of seeing it from more southerly latitudes towards the equator. So, uh, you know, try and catch the moon as a, as a really thin crescent as soon as you can after new moon or just before it disappears to new moon. And then, of course, catch it close to celestial objects as well. So when the moon's close to uh, some bright planets or some bright stars or clusters, that's really nice as well. So here's the, the moon taken last year. So you've got Venus down here. And that's Mercury as well. I had to go away from home to capture this because I don't have a very good uh, southern or western horizon. Uh, so uh, I had to get out to try and capture these. So catch the moon when it's close to these celestial objects because it makes a really nice view. And then, of course, the Earth shine when it's a nice crescent. Look out for the Earth shine. And if you can, try and observe the moon then as well because you can see one of the bright craters here Aristarchus is really really bright and it really does stand out when 
the the moon's a crescent and it's got the earth shine shining on it because it is so bright but we'll come to that um in a little while because that's one of my favorite craters and then catch a mineral moon so if you take a picture of the moon now you don't realize that you've probably got pictures on your hard disk or on your disk on your camera that you've taken of the moon that do show the colors of the regolith so you can capture that quite nicely and you've probably already got pictures that have captured that and not realized it uh, so i have put on my website a guide to actually producing a mineral moon using photoshop by increasing the saturation so give it a go get some of your old images of the moon out and see if you can draw out some of the colors of the regolith on the surface because it's absolutely wonderful because the uh, bluer areas are rich in titanium and the brown areas are rich in iron so uh, you can see the differences on the surface which is fantastic and another huge feature is mari imbrium absolutely fantastic impact feature and it's got so many little details going around it uh, that you you know you can spend just hours just looking at those and then towards the southern part of the uh, moon we've got this crater here which is clavius and it's just jam-packed full of these tiny little craterlets and of course it depends when you go out and what the scene is like how small the craterlets you can see on the floor of that crater but when you get a really good night you can count lots and lots of craters so get out there and keep looking because it does change night to night and this was a night that was really really good but the image is a little bit grainy but you can see it's captured really really tiny craters in the bottom of the crater and then when the sun is just rising these two craters in the bottom of the floor because the edges of the crater are slightly raised above the rest of the surface they just catch the sunlight as it goes through and creates this impression of the eyes of clavia so that's quite nice if you catch that at just the right time and then we've got the straight wall rupus rector so here it is so this is sunrise and um, so just the sun rising over it and you can see it's creating the shadow it's not quite as steep as it would uh, look there so it's not really a wall it's more of a slight incline but those long shadows do make it stand up really really well and you see this little rill down here near the crater burt as well which is quite nice and then once the sun's actually gone the other side so once you've gone past full moon the sun is coming from the other direction so instead of getting the shadow you get it as a bright line in there and some people have said it looks like a sword a saber on the surface of the, the moon so that's quite nice and of course the lunar x everybody gets really excited about a lunar x it's another one of these clear obscure effects that you can see and mary mcintyre produces a blog where she uh, puts down the lunar x times so here's the moon so this was taken it's all it's just around first quarter when you get the sunlight just hitting it right and you can see the lunar x just here down there there it is and it just happens it's, it lasts for about two hours as the sun's rising over three craters and it's Purbeck, Lecale and Blankiness and it's the ramparts of those three craters that just catch the sunlight and produce this x, x effect so really really nice to catch that just the right time but it only lasts for about two hours and you have to see it at just the right time because if the time happens when the sunlight hits it and it's below the horizon you're not going to see it so you can't catch that every single month so there's the lunar x but if you look at it a few days later i specifically went out to take this picture just to show what the difference is so here's the x a few days later when the uh, sun is almost overhead on the feature and you can see it doesn't really stand out at all so nobody's looking at the lunar x at this time so it gets a bit left out when uh, it comes to that time of the moon and if you leave it a little while later when the sun's setting again you can see it looks nothing like the lunar x here um, uh, but the shadows are nice in the crater there which looks really nice the shadows look fantastic on the moon when you catch them right and of course there's the lunar v as well which happens around about the same time oops i've missed my moon there it is so it's the lunar v here so it's a little bit further north so there's the lunar x you can see there and there's the lunar v 
So here it is. It's uh, part of Mara vape, Vaporum, close to Rima Hygienus. So this is the Rima here. And then a few craters, Trisnecker, Agrippa. I always think that sounds like a wrestler myself. Um, and a few other, other craters around there as well. And Robin mentioned Mari Oriental. And here it is. So this is a view taken from Luke Jerram's Museum of the Moon. And if you haven't seen the Museum of the Moon, when we're allowed to, just go out and see it because it's absolutely amazing. So this is a view we can't get of this huge impact feature on the surface of the moon because it's just tucked around the edge so we can't quite see it around the edge but because the moon wobbles slightly so this is the sort of view we normally get so you can just see hints of it here you can see th this long bit here is this bit here and this little wiggly bit here is the same as this one and this is Grimaldi one of the uh, featureless craters which is a little bit further around the edge but libration the moon wobbling slightly this effect of libration actually brings it more into view at certain times of the month and so you can see here this is taken on a different evening you can see how much further mario and tal has moved into view so we can see a little bit further into the crater and sometimes it's not as good sometimes it's not as far so you have to wait for your moment to actually catch it when it's really leaning in and here's an explanation when somebody says you why do you keep taking the same part of the moon because next time you go out you get a much better image because the scene's much better and so you can see this one was liberated in quite a long way and the actual image came out really really nicely but it does need a favorable liberation to be able to see it and here's one that was a little bit better that particular even you can even see the uh, floor of the Mari itself just coming into view as it nodded in to view so yeah we've got a nice peek into that around the edge and that was taken last year the crater Plato in the northern part of Mari Imbrium yeah, it's got these lovely shadows as well and it looks pretty flat most of the time but if you get the shadows right and you get the seeing right get out with your telescope and see if you can spot some of these little craterlets in the floor of the big crater i've managed to capture five on this one and this reel going out to the edge here so get out and have a look and see if you can see those little craterlets but you have to get the sun at just the right angle and then ptolemaeus that's a lovely crater this huge one here it's got this little ghost crater sitting in there as well that was pointed out to me when i was younger um, there's a really nice feature you can see in that so that's Alphonsus, the crater below, and Arzekal. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly. And Albategnius. I don't give myself any favours doing these anyway. But if you look at it from that point of view, the person pointed out to me in an image um, a long while ago, with these shadows, they create shapes, and the human brain is really good at picking out shapes. And somebody pointed out a photo to me when I was quite young, probably about 14, 15 at the time, and showed me a, an image of uh, Ptolemaeus. And when the shadow's just right, it looks like a church or a cathedral. And I've only ever seen it twice since I was a teenager. So you have to catch it at the right time. And that's when I tried to capture a webcam to show it developing and do a time lapse, but it didn't turn out very well. But it did capture the uh, effect anyway. And then next door to that, we've got this Catina Davy or the Davy crater chain. So you can see it here. Now, this is uh, a line of craters that have been created by something breaking up before it hit the surface of the moon. So there it is. So you can see this line of craters all lined up nicely along the moon. So there's Ptolemaeus again, Alphonsus, and that's the Davy crater. And this is the chain or the Catina. In there and there's 23 individual craters within that uh, impact so you know that's quite a nice little feature to look out for but they are quite small craters so you do need a really steady night to be able to see them and here's an image taken by apollo 12 of the chain look at that absolutely marvelous seen from lunar orbit 
And another one that I really like is the Messier crater, named after Charles Messier, the famous comet hunter. And you can see why it's named after Charles Messier, because it has these two rays leading away from it. But it's a double crater because they think it's an impactor that hit at an angle. So it sort of bounced and made two craters and splashed out the material from the surface of the moon into those two tails. And there's an image taken a little bit higher resolution, a little bit grainy, but you can see the strange shapes of these two craters. But have a look and see if you can see those two tails because they do stand out easily, even in binoculars. So get out there and have a look at Messier Crater and have a nod to the famous uh, comet hunter from the past. And there's an, another one as well showing that strange structure within the crater. Um, I mentioned Aristarchus, the really bright crater. So it's a very young crater seen in the um, earth shine on the dark side of, of the moon. So here is um, the crater. And you can see it's got some sort of structure around the edges, which is quite nice. And we've also got next door to it, the uh, Schroeter's Valley. So that's a cobra shaped valley here, collapsed lava tube, they think. Uh, so that's great to look out for when the uh, sunlight is in the uh, right illumination for that. And it's surrounded by this huge brown deposit. So again, it's rich, very rich in iron that gives this this brown coloration. And then an unusual feature, a little bit further over, is Rima Gamma. Now this is what they call a lunar swell. Did I put it? Yes, I did put it on. So it's a lunar swell. And these seem to be quite strange things because the surface of the moon goes dark over time because of the sunlight acting on it. But these areas of the moon, they don't fade in time. And that's also a reason why young craters look really bright because it's revealed fresh material from beneath the surface and that goes darker over time but these areas there seem to be a magnetic anomaly on the moon surface so it actually prevents some of that sunlight hitting the surface so these lunar swells seem to keep bright for longer than the rest of the uh, surface you can see it extends quite a way across the moon surface and that's protected from the sunlight by this magnetic field that's preventing as many um, as much solar energy hitting the surface as the rest of the moon so it stays brighter and fra Mauro, i did mention um, it's the 50th anniversary of the uh, apollo missions and of course this is the landing site of apollo 12 they landed over here but more importantly because tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of the launch of apollo 14 oh also surveyor 3 landed there as well so they wanted a pinpoint landing because Apollo 11 didn't quite land where it was meant to. So when Apollo 12 came in, they wanted to land very close to Surveyor 3 and make sure that they got pinpoint landing so they knew exactly where they were going to land. So they nailed that one. And of course, it's 50th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 14 tomorrow and the landing next Saturday. And this is where they landed just above Fra Moro Crater. So launch tomorrow and then landed on the 5th of February, uh, 5th of March, sorry. No, 5th of February, it is February. I'm getting confused. Yes, it is the 5th of February, okay. And of course, another landing site of the Apollo missions, because it's the Apollo missions that probably got me into astronomy and really keen when I was young. And of course, this is part of Mari Imbrium. Uh, so this is Hadley Real. Uh, it's a landing site of Apollo 15. So here it is in a bit of closer detail. And they actually landed just by the reel here. So we've got some wonderful views. Have a look at the Apollo 15 images and you can see the reel uh, where they're standing close to it. So absolutely fantastic place to have a look and see if you can pick that reel out. And then of course, I can't finish without showing the most famous part of the moon, the Mari Tranquillitatis, which of course is the landing site of the Apollo 11 mission. And they landed just there. These are the twin craters, Sabine and Ritter, one of them be, still being in the shadow at this time, but it does show these lovely wrinkle ridges going across there surrounding this ghost crater Stadius in the Mari. And if we look a little bit closer at that image, there are three craters on there named after the astronauts. There's Armstrong, and that's 4.6 kilometers wide. So it gives you some sort of a sense of scale 
on the image. Collins in the middle there is only 2.4 kilometers wide. And then Aldrin is a bit bigger at 3.4 kilometers wide. So Collins has missed out again, you know, missed out on the landing. And he seems to get missed out when people talk about the Apollo 11 landing as well. But he was just as important as the other two that actually did walk on the moon. So that's my sights of the moon. So I hope you've enjoyed my tour of the moon. And of course, I'm going to be on social media putting things about the Apollo uh, missions and uh, as they go on, on the 50th anniversary. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Um, tell us about your meeting, your next meeting of the Virtual Astronomy Club. Yes, we've got Nicholas Booth, who's coming in to tell us about hope and perseverance dispatches from a red planet. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that's on Tuesday evening at um, 7 p.m. And you can tell us the, the, the place to go to. Yeah, if I pop it in the chat to everybody, let me just move this over here. So the web, I'll make sure it goes to everybody. Did you take all those lunar photographs yourself? I guess I you did. did. Yeah beautiful photographs <clears throat> and i can see the colors that you were talking about on many of those as well that's right yeah because when I, I i use a one-shot color camera so what i do i go in and i slightly saturate the colors but uh, it's a very fine balance between bringing out the colors and making them too much yeah so, so uh, yeah so i hope it encourages a lot of other people to go out and photograph the moon and uh, i hope one day we'll be able to get our uh, lunar section director dave graham on I, I i'm not sure if he's watching today but uh, he will um, he, he he's got to get his um a zoom talk together and maybe he'll uh, get he'll be coming along to a meeting in a in a few months time so that's that's great the moon is a great object to watch don't um, don't overlook it just because it's wiping out the deep sky objects as dave observes both types so um he, he's certainly made the most of the the bright parts of the moon and all phases of the moon are equally interesting i love those pictures particularly with the marian oriental when you see the edge the limb of the moon and you can almost imagine yourself at high magnification flying off across the surface of the moon of course it's interesting to compare your photographs uh, for example and your views of the limb of the moon and the fairly shallow um, slopes of the craters with the views which people drew way back in the well even the middle of the last century where they showed as you say everything had to have really sharp spikes and there are plenty of drawings even people like Chesley Bonnestall drew very sharp spikes on the lunar mountains <clears throat> whereas yeah, in fact if the, the, you can you don't need to to, to assume that they're, they're quite shallow slopes in in fact aren't they but when the, when the sun is rising over those features they do cast really long shadows and it does make them really stand and pop out along the terminator so you know it's well worth looking up and down the terminator and seeing what you can see you can see light flooding into little craters you can see uh, a bit like the eyes of um Clave, you can see other little craters popping up above it, the shadows and, and things like that. So it's always something to look out for. Yes. It always looks different. So every time you go out there, the sunlight angle is slightly different and it looks different. Yes, and, and Paul Addison was on Amazon um, chat has just said uh, Surface of the Moon in the film 2001 also had those very spiky uh, lunar features. But that's Hollywood for you. And actually, I always say that that is one of the most obvious reasons why the Apollo landings, really, the photographs they took were genuine ones. If Hollywood had faked those, they would have made a much better job of the lunar landscape, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> because that's what we would have all expected to see. So the, the very boring pictures we saw had to be real. They would, Hollywood wouldn't have made it up like that. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Dave. And hopefully that will inspire people to go and look at the moon. Uh, I'm glad to say that we've got um, meetings coming up in in April and July. They've we, we've we've got the speakers all organized for those and we will try and add the odd meeting uh, in between for you. If um, um, if if you're interested in coming along, we will uh, we, we certainly 
try, try to add some more meetings as well. And don't forget Vicky's shows every Friday night. The, the last one was an absolute cracker, full of information and uh, also contributions from individual members as well. It's great to hear. Stephen, over to you. Ah, <laughs> I guess it just uh, falls to me to uh, uh, to wrap up. I was just going to add that uh, Vicky's meetings are really buzzy. They are they're a great show. So catch them on Friday nights from 8 p.m. I think it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Most, mostly every Friday on night. Facebook. And, and the next one will be um, uh, uh, David Hardy and also uh, Stuart Clark will be on. And also the news from Elena Tsiar Kalaris, who will be giving the latest news, which hasn't happened yet. We haven't heard about it. And she will be giving the latest uh, <laughs> space travel and weather, as Vicky calls it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tune into that. It's going to be great. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for attending. I, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. I was, <laughs> it, it was a, a great meeting, I thought, anyway. And, uh, the Hubble constant controversy is it is the weirdest and probably the deepest and most exciting mystery in uh, cosmology at the moment. And it was lovely to see so much going on uh, uh, and and uh, uh, to find out what you can see and do uh, observing the moon as well. And I, I just love observing the moon. It's like seeing another world. I mean, literally, it's seeing another world. It's just glorious. So uh, thank you much, everybody. And... Um, uh the last thing is just to say uh the next meeting will be uh chaired by our new president andrew coates who's a professor at uh, U uh mssl and you is it mssl or ucl would you say you're at andrew you're, you're muted oh, you're on mute yeah yeah so um we're part of ucl we're a department of ucl um department of space and climate physics but mullard space science lab yes has a, a special identity of its own as well so yeah <laughs> Hmm. I'd like to say thank you to Stephen for being up with us for the last two years and I'm glad to say we're not seeing the back of him yet because he will be around as vice president and quite often in the habit of of uh, people that we invite to become SPA presidents they stay with us for quite a while after that so uh, we hope to see him many times again in the future. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And with that, I shall close the meeting and I hope you've all enjoyed it. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.